I've missed you, One Church Two. I've been away for the last couple of weeks. I took some time away and uh, did summer with my family. And can you believe that we are into the last week of summer of 2024? I know, I know, you're booing at me. You know what, I'd like to boo as well. I hope that you have enjoyed your summer. For my family, um, this has been the summer of soccer. And that's interesting because we are not a soccer family. In fact, my husband, he is, you might not know this, he's a hockey player, he loves hockey. So we have spent many hours, many years at the rink. But this year, our son, who is eight years old, decided that he wanted to play soccer, much to his dad's disappointment. And so we have learned how to sit on grassy fields over the course of this summer. Now, when I signed him up to play, he wanted to play with his school friends, and so we all tried to sign up to play soccer. The league wrote back to me, and they said, hey, the boys can only play together if a parent volunteers to be their coach. And I thought, what a beautiful opportunity this would be. We're already talking about serving our community and how we can do that. What a great opportunity for us to put into practice what we're talking about. We can serve our community by teaching eight eight-year-old boys how to play soccer. And you know what I did? Well, I wrote them right back and I said, no problem, my husband Skip, he will coach the team. <laughs> now, before you come at me and say, hey, you should have coached the team, I spent much of my summer sitting on the sidelines cheering on these eight-year-old boys. And I discovered something as I watched them learn to pass and shoot and try and work as a team. I discovered something. Each player has a very notable strength or maybe several strengths, but most of them are completely unaware of their growth areas. And I thought, you know what? We all are a little bit like an eight-year-old soccer player. Each of us is far more familiar and attuned to our strengths than maybe the areas that we can grow in. Now, we are in our final week of our summer series. It's called Becoming Me, where we've been taking a look at some of the ancient practices that God designed for his people to live in with throughout history. Now, these were the eight practices that we've looked at before, and these are the practices that actually Jesus modeled for us when he was living on this earth, and they're the practices that God says if we embrace in our lives, they actually help us to become more like Jesus. So I hope that you've been encouraged by our staff stories over these past eight weeks as I have been, and you've been able to work on some areas in your own life. Now, today we're going to take a look at the final ancient practice of our series, and that is the practice of community. Now, last year, if you can remember, like over a year ago, we were in a series called Rewire, and we did a little exercise together, and it looks something like this. It was a bunch of circles, and it was a map of your relationships. Some of you might remember it. Now, these three circles represent all the relationships that go on in your life. The middle inner circle is actually the core. And the core is the people who are the closest to you, that you would share everything with. These are the people that you're going to call in a crisis in the middle of the night. These are the people that are going to have your back no matter what. The outer circle is your acquaintances. Most of the people that you know by name actually fit in this category. They're your social contacts. They're going to know everything about you that you would post on social media, high level updates. And in the world that we live in, it can be very tempting to believe that this is actually your community, but it's not. So be careful not to confuse this outer circle with the middle circle, because the middle circle is actually your community. These are the people who know you, meaning they know you beyond a social media status. These are the people who are going to show up when you're sick. They're going to be the people who celebrate and cheer you on during your life. They're going to be the ones who carry you through difficult seasons. You can trust these people. Their voice matters in your life. It carries weight. And today we're going to be talking about them, about your community. And the first truth that I want us all to understand is this. My community grows when I grow. Now, I told you that Max has been playing soccer, and throughout the summer, he's discovered that his favorite position to play is goalie, which, let me tell you, is the most stressful position for a parent to watch their child play. That was him this weekend. They had their final championship. He loves to play the goalie. Here's the problem. Games are, are won or lost through defense. See, if he can defend their net well, 
his team is going to win. But if the goalie is unable to defend the net, then his team will lose. Talk about stressful for a parent on the sideline. But you know what? As Max's skills have developed, and as his friend's skills have developed, his team has improved. See, the team is better when they show up and they've practiced and they're prepared and they're ready to go. And the same is true in our lives. Our community gets better when we get better. It's the ancient principle of all tides rise when one tide rises. But you know what? I wonder if anyone in your life has ever gotten healthier. Anyone know anyone in your life that's gotten healthier in any type of area, anyone in your community? What usually happens is that everyone in the family starts to get a little bit healthier because our actions and our decisions have an impact on our community. Now, today I want to take a look at a very difficult moment in the history of a community. In the Old Testament, we read that God is building a family, and he calls them the Israelites. And God's plan is for this family to grow and expand, to become a community that God is going to use, he says, to bless the whole world through. You see, from the very first moment when Adam and Eve chose to disobey and eat from the fruit, that's when sin was introduced in the world. But God had a plan and he planned to send Jesus to fix the problem of sin once and for all. But God's plan was actually to send Jesus through a family line that would trace through generations through the community that he was creating. Now, it's important to know that this community didn't always get things right. See, they were not a perfect people. In fact, over and over, we read in the Bible that they mess up and they don't trust God. They disobey. And they go through this cycle of not trusting God over and over. So they don't trust God. They don't obey him. God allows something difficult to come into their lives, a season of difficulty. What happens is they then turn to him. They pray. They ask him to rescue him. God shows up every single time. He rescues them. They celebrate. They thank him. They start to follow him. And then very soon after, they go through the cycle again, and they start not trusting him and not obeying him. So God allows a difficulty to come into their lives so that they turn back to him. Over and over and over, this cycle happens. And today, this story takes place in the middle of one of these cycles. It's in a season where they have been incredibly disobedient and untrusting of God. See, they doubt his goodness, and they refuse to follow him. And so God allows them to fall into a difficult season so that their eyes might turn back towards him. And our story starts in the book of Ruth, chapter one. And it says this, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So that's it right there. That is the difficulty that has happened. God has allowed a severe famine to come upon their land. And we continue reading. So a man from Bethlehem left his home and he went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi. And when they had reached Moab, they settled there. Now, here we have a family, probably one of several, who have made the choice to leave their community when things got hard. They've chosen to retreat. And you know what? I'm not shocked at all by what they chose to do. Given the choice, you and I probably might make similar decision to leave because the reality is that we are often tempted to leave when life gets difficult. See, it's this tendency that goes back to the very beginning of time. When Adam and Eve find themselves in conflict with God in a difficult situation, what do they do? They retreat. They hide. They attempt to pull away from him. Now, having pastored for over 20 years, I found that people have a tendency to do one of two things often when things are difficult or they are hurting. And it's this. The first is they isolate. They pull themselves away from others, away from the community. And the second thing is they try and relocate. So often they'll move themselves, hopefully to go to an easier 
environment. I can't tell you how many pastoral conversations that I have had with people over the years who are struggling with some sort of situation or some sort of circumstance, and it always breaks my heart when one of their first instincts is to isolate or relocate from their community. And you know what? I understand. I understand why they want to do that, because they're hurting, they're in pain, they're grieving. But my encouragement to them is always the same. If you're in a healthy community, then stay. Stay with your community. Because if you've found a healthy community to belong to, friends, it is always worth staying and journeying through a difficult season with your community rather than on your own. And while it's understandable why this family was tempted to relocate, leaving their community in Bethlehem for a place called Moab was not just a decision about food. See, it was a decision about trust. Remember, this is a cycle that the Israelite people have continually been going through over and over and over. When they choose not to obey or choose not to trust God, God allows a difficult circumstance into their lives. This causes them to turn back to God and God rescues them over and over. God has rescued his people from slavery, from wars, from other famines. In difficult seasons, God wants his children to pull closer to him, not farther away. But by choosing to leave Bethlehem, this family was declaring that they did not trust God. And especially concerning, by leaving Bethlehem and choosing to move to Moab, they were directly disobeying God's orders. Because God had instructed his people throughout history multiple times to have nothing to do with this place called Moab. See, in one morning, God instructs his people and he says this, as long as you live, you must never have anything to do with the Moabites. Moab did not welcome you with food and water when you came out of Egypt. That's when they were in slavery and they came out. They were not welcomed by them. Instead, they hired Balaam to curse you, but God turns that intended curse into a blessing because the Lord your God loves you. See, Elimelech and Naomi would have grown up hearing these warnings over and over and over. This was not news to them. But they chose to disregard God's instructions and instead they headed straight to Moab, expecting that life would be less difficult and more bearable. But it was anything but. Because shortly after they settle in Moab, tragedy strikes their family. We read this. Then Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women, but about 10 years later, both of her sons died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons and without her husband. So there's Naomi. She's living in a foreign land, living in the land of her enemy. Now, because she lived in a patriarchal society, she may not have even had much say about the relocation. She may not have even been able to say much about it, but she had been relocated. Her husband has now died. Her sons have died. I imagine this is the darkest season of her entire life. In fact, she says this about that season. She says, I went away full, but now I am empty. No longer call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. Friends, the truth is that difficult seasons are more difficult when we face them alone. So Naomi's season of deep grief was actually compounded because she was not with her community. She's left with these two Moabite daughter-in-laws living in the place that God told them not to go, which in itself I think is a sobering reminder for all of us because each of us have people that follow us. I have children that follow us, but I have a whole community that follows. We have people in our lives, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. People are watching what we're doing and they're following what we're doing, but especially for those of us who call ourselves parents and are leading children. Because the truth is that my decisions will lead my community either closer to God or further away from him. You see, when Elimelech and Naomi move their family to Moab, they are declaring to their sons that their desires and their comforts trump following God's instructions. I'm going to say that again. They're declaring to their sons that their own desires and their own comforts trump God's instructions. 
See, when they moved to Moab, they set their sons on a path of disobedience, which results in their boys entering covenants with individuals that God has instructed them not to. Friends, our decisions will always impact those who live around us. The choices we make will either encourage people to follow Jesus or they will lead them farther away from him. Which is why we need to be very careful, especially in moments of difficulty where we're in grief or sadness or sorrow, that we're very careful on our decisions, that we're continuing to lead people closer to Jesus. Now, you might be like me. Maybe you're honest enough to admit that some of your decisions have not led people closer to Jesus. Maybe if you're really honest. If I look at my life, I can be honest and say some of my decisions have actually caused people to disobey God. Friends, if that's you, I want to encourage you because there is always an opportunity to make better choices in the future because thankfully, Naomi's story does not end there. In fact, in her darkest hour, Naomi makes the difficult decision to go back, retrace her steps, and go back to her community in Bethlehem. And as Naomi is packing up her things and getting ready for the big journey ahead back to Bethlehem, Ruth one of her Moabite daughter-in-laws, comes to her and says, I want to go back with you and return to the people of God. She says this, it's a beautiful declaration. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And say Naomi makes the journey back to Bethlehem with Ruth. And I imagine there's a lot of nerves going on inside of her, right? She's probably worried as she walks back to her community, probably wondering what everyone else is going to think. You see, her and her husband had made the decision to leave them when they were going through a difficult season as a community. And now she was returning without her family. In fact, she instead she's bringing a Moabite woman who is the enemy of the Israelites. You know what I love? I love what happens when they go back to Bethlehem. The Bible says, as they step into Bethlehem, when they arrived, the whole town was stirred up and excited because of them. What a beautiful picture of an imperfect community. Now, it's my prayer as one of your pastors that when people would choose to come to One Church TO, when they would come into our lives, that we would be excited that God led them to us. Today I want to introduce you to someone very special on our staff team. Many of you probably know him. Uh, Shesh oversees all of our care ministries here at One Church TO, and he is passionate about community, and he embraces the practice of community in his life. And so today I've asked him to share with us how this practice of community has actually shaped and impacted his life. Let's take a look together. This is the outdoor season, the perfect time of the year for cottages, camping, and picnics. Have you ever gone camping or to the cottage? To end that perfect day, you build a campfire. There's something wondrous about sitting around a campfire with loved ones. The flames draw you in, the conversations are richer, sharing stories, roasting marshmallows, sharing life and laughter. If you've ever camped with me, or should I say if you've ever glamped with me, you would know how I like to wind down that perfect day with that campfire. I'm the master of the fire pit. The nights are cool, dark, and damp. I sit, I pace, I poke around, mesmerized by the fire. I will keep it going at any cost, even in the rain, while my wife sits patiently beside me, soaking in the rain with that gracious smile. To get that fire going, you have to intentionally pile these logs close together and make sure the Kindle and the Tinder is laid in specific places where they could ignite. And with a tad bit of lighter fluid, yeah, I said it, 
I cheat with lighter fluid. And then that last spark makes everything dance and dazzle. Some of the most beautiful memories have been around a campfire, celebrating friendships, confiding in each other, encouraging one another, building community, deep relationships, and how I cannot forget those yummy, warm marshmallows burnt to perfection every time. Doing life in circles with one another, together, that's epic. God does wonderful things when we come together doing one another things each day with one another. In the New Testament alone, we find one another 59 times. Scripture encourages us to do something with each other again and again. Galatians 5.13 says, serve one another in love. Carry each other's burdens, says Galatians 6.2. Pray for each other, James 5.16. I love this one. Spur one another towards love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, 24. Surely we have all been commanded to love one another. I've been part of this church family for 30 years and we do this so, so well. I see it firsthand each week in the hallways as you pass each other, in the, in the cafe as we share our stories, in the parking lot giving way for another to park, the big hugs and the smiles in the lobby, the kindness of the volunteers in the children's section. We know how to love one another. But let's not stop there. I want to take this opportunity to draw you in deeper into some uncomfortable places and spaces where your elbows get dirty and where you may encounter some rough edges. I know you're shocked. Me with rough edges? Ask my wife and kids. I have rough edges. Pastor Jonathan encourages us often to lean in. So I'm gonna ask you today, lean in. Let's lean into each other a bit more. Or should I say, let's lean into each other a lot more. Before Jesus left this earth, he spends his earthly moments with his friends, gathering them together one last time for something great. He knew how to do one another things each day. One of the most powerful moments in the New Testament is when the Holy Spirit came and rested upon its believers in the upper room. In Acts 2, 1 to 4, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were staying. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. This event didn't take place in isolation. However, it happened when men and women, young and old, met together. Who do you see in the upper room? I see Peter, a close friend of Jesus who denied him. Two brothers with their shattered dreams of earthly power and honor. Individuals with deferring ambitions. In silence, I see Jesus' mother dealing with a vast array of her emotions. We see a broken and ridiculed community grieving the loss of their teacher and master. They were left with more questions than answers fearing for their lives, navigating chaotic moments together. But within this chaos, our God sees his children gathering together. He dramatically births the genesis of an awe-inspiring community that will change this world. It says they were together in one place. I absolutely love that. They were together with one another in prayer and God moves. This happens weekly within our church with the many community groups that meet, when we meet together, pray together, sing together, and do life together, God shows up. He changes our lives and our circumstances. Verse five speaks of people from many nations under heaven. That's like our church, One Church TO. Look around and you will see the vibrance of our cultures around us. There is a purpose in our diversity. There is abundance in our diversity, and there is beauty in our diversity. You were made unique with a purpose and your lived experience is designed to inspire others. Let's celebrate our diversity and uniqueness. This is your church and you belong here. Later in verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and breaking of bread and to prayer. We do this on Sundays corporately, but there's great value in meeting in smaller groups more intimate times together during the week where we could share our feelings, share our stories, 
let down our walls, and as scripture says, as iron sharpens iron, we could sharpen each other in love. They were doing one another things when the Holy Spirit encountered them. There was something beautiful and powerful when we meet together with one another. Pastor Andy Stanley puts it this way, the primary activity of the church was one anothering one another. Let me say that again. The primary activity of the church was one anothering one another. One Church TO, let's become a church known for one anothering one another. Acts 2.45 says, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They met each other's needs as Jesus would. They knew how to lean in, to be available, to go into those uncomfortable places and to make the load lighter for each other. Every day they met and broke bread, not only on Sundays, not once a week, but every day. You have many opportunities here at One Church TO to gather with each other more often. Opportunities to do something outside of Sundays. Just as he did on the day of Pentecost, God is waiting to do incredible things through us when we meet together in obedience and do life together as he intended. Here's a small glimpse of what happens when we are obedient to God. Acts 2 verse 47 says, Praising God, enjoying the favor of people, the Lord added to their numbers daily who were being saved. That should excite us. I'm sure we all desire this. Praising God, yes. Living with purpose, yes. God adding to his family daily, yes. One anothering, one another delights God. At times we like to do things with each other, but with just those who look like us and talk like us, and to those who agree with us and nod to our rhythms. But Jesus was found in the margins of society. I'm sure when we push ourselves to the boundaries and into the margins, our eyes will see Jesus in these places and our hearts will break for the things of God. Jesus' heart is for the most marginalized amongst us, the widows, the orphans, the homeless, the young and old. Jesus is found in the margins of life. Jesus modeled this one another life on earth. He reclined with his friend Lazarus. He gets his elbows dirty with Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. He broke bread with them. He laughed with them. He cried with them. He served them. Many long boat rides, many long walks, many nights by the fire. He did life with them. Let's step outside our comfort zone and into the margins and become the hands and feet of Jesus. Even from the beginning, from the creation story in itself, we know we were not intended to do life alone, not intended to carry the load in isolations. So let's revisit that campfire. When these logs are piled together close, burning together, it is radiant. The heat, the inspiring illumination, it's a symphony of crackles. The heat from this campfire radiates beyond the immediate. The noise and crackles can be heard from the neighboring campsites and the radiant light seen from afar. The heat, sound and light keeps the darkness at bay. It keeps the wild animals afar and it drowns out the fears of the unknown in the dark surrounding woods. But all this beauty and power can be snuffed out quickly. When you start separating these logs, making spaces between them, drawing them further out individually and drawing them further from each other. Soon they cannot sustain themselves, flickering out, eventually they go out. All this dynamism, heat and radiance gone so quickly. As your care pastor, I'm invited into people's brokenness each week, dealing with grief and depression, addictions, family and marital tensions, health issues, financial stresses, these are all too difficult for us to handle. But it's even more heartbreaking when I see people suffering in silence, suffering in silos, all alone without community. These moments sadden me the most. It is too hard to carry these burdens alone. I know, I have tried it. I have lived void of community where I have suffered alone miss the fullness of his blessings, seasons of loneliness where I feel stuck, lacking purpose, no joy or fulfillment. Eugene Peterson says it this way, I am not myself by myself. 
One Church TO, I say to you, I am not myself without you. My holistic Christian experience is only possible with you in my life. How you ask? I'm glad you asked. Did you know God inspires me through you? Did you know that God convicts me through you? Did you know that God brings me great joy through you? And did you know He shows me His love through you? I am not myself without you. The last 40 days have been some of the most difficult for my family. We have been in crisis mode day and night, a load too heavy to carry alone. One Church CO family, thank you for lightening that load. Your prayers, your calls, those emails, those cooked meals, those hugs. You have carried us and you continue to carry us. And that is the beauty of God's community. God brings so many people through these doors and into our lives each week. We could easily miss what God is doing. At times, we don't even see the many blessings before us. We could easily miss the heart of God and His design for us. One Church TO, he is calling us to the margins, away from the comfortable middle, the us for and no more mentality, out of our pews, out of our comforts, so we can not only go into Jerusalem, but into Judea and further into Samaria. These places make us uncomfortable and anxious. We may get our elbows dirty. There is always a cost to living a sacrificial life of commonality. But let's not miss God's purpose for us and His fullness of His blessings upon us. If you know anything about me, you know community, being together, sharing stories, sharing laughs, a life of commonality excites me. I can't function normally without frequent moments of togetherness. I longed for Sundays, and soon God gave me not only Sundays, but also Wednesdays, attending follow night classes and our community groups, meeting people at the food bank on Tuesdays and those spontaneous coffee dates and the many other times that we spend together with his people. I know my kids will be shocked when they hear me say these two words. Be selfish. Be selfish about being included. Be bold. Step out. Don't wait for me to ask. Don't wait for Pastor Jonathan or Pastor Jessica to invite you into a moment. Become a person who is included not only for yourself, but for us, all of us. This is why I'm so passionate about community. I am so confident you will be a blessing to many. So this leads me to a question. Have you found community? Have you found a safe place to be yourself? A people to share your heart with, your concerns with, your disappointments with, to carry your burdens? A people who will love you and celebrate you while you love and celebrate them back? as God intended. Have you found community? I want to challenge you, One Church TO, because I love you and I know your heart. Let's not only invite people to church, but invite them into our lives. Well, thank you, Shesh. What an encouragement that is for all of us today. We are not complete on our own. We actually need each other. Friends, God designed us to live in circles with each other, to become people who are included and to become people who are included. We need to raise our hand and be a little bit selfish, like Shesh taught us. Just like signing up for a sports team, we need to decide if we want to be included. You know what? My favorite part of the story of Naomi and her family is that Ruth is also given the choice to be, in, to be included. See, it's fascinating to me that Ruth chooses to leave Moab, her hometown, and everything that she has ever known because she recognizes that there is something different about Naomi and the God that Naomi follows. Ruth is so drawn to the God of the Israelites that she gives up everything that she has, everything that she knows to travel back with Naomi and go back to Bethlehem and not just visit, but join the family of God. And why I love this part of the story so much is that it means this, everyone is welcomed 
into the family of God. See, not only is Ruth embraced by the community when she shows up in Bethlehem, not only are they excited and they bring her into community, but Ruth ends up marrying one of the most humble, one of the most honest, one of the most influential leaders of that time. His name is Boaz. And God blesses Boaz and Ruth with a son. And the Bible tells us that God chooses to use Ruth and Boaz's family line to eventually send his son, Jesus, to the world. And so Ruth, the Moabite woman who chooses to join the family of God, becomes the great, 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 great grandmother of the Messiah that the Israelites and the whole world have been waiting for forever. Friends, God is the master story writer. And through Ruth's story, he declares that everyone who wants to be is welcomed into his family. As we prepare to close, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads just to create a moment of personal reflection for those who are around you. Now, maybe today you might identify with Naomi or Ruth. Maybe like Ruth, you did not grow up knowing about God. This might be the very first time that you have ever heard about the community of God and this family that he has been building since the beginning of time. Maybe it's the first time you've ever considered the idea of choosing to follow God. The Bible tells us that God is continually drawing people to himself, just like he did with Ruth. And today might be the first time that you have ever felt that. And maybe today, as you feel that, you're ready to respond to God. If that's you, I'd love for you to let me know so that I can pray with you. If you're in the room, I just invite you to lift your head for a moment and look at me. Yeah, I see that. I see that. I'm going to be praying with you. If you're online, you can push that button in the chat room. We would love to pray with you today. Just before I do that, I I also think of those who... Maybe identify with Naomi. Maybe you do know God. Maybe at some point in your journey, you followed him and you were a part of his community. But at some point, maybe you took some steps away from him and away from his community. Maybe today you feel God drawing you back. Through Shesha's words, maybe you're realizing that you need to take a step back into his community. If that's you today, I would love to pray with you. I'm going to invite you just to look up at me for a moment so that I can pray with you. Yeah, I see that. Online, you can let us know in the chat room. We're going to pray together as we all take steps towards God and his community. So if that's you, if you feel, if you recognize, hey, I want to take a step towards this God, like Ruth, I've never known him before, but I would love to get to know him. Or like Naomi, I knew him and I stepped away and I'm ready to step back. Let me pray with you today. Father, I thank you that you are a God that that created us, God. You created the world. And when you did that, Father, when you created the world, you didn't just leave us, but you wanted to be close to us, God. The Bible says that you walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. It was your deepest desire to be in community with us, God. You designed us for community, community with you and community with others. And God, I think of my friends who would admit they feel, they they identify with a Ruth or a Naomi. Maybe this is the first time they've ever heard of the community of God. Or maybe they've been a part of the community like Naomi, but in this moment, they've taken steps away, God. Father, I thank you that you draw us close to you. I thank you that you love us and you sent your son, Jesus, to the world with a plan to die on the cross God, to fix the problem of sin that separated you from us. You are a good father, God, and we can trust you. And so, God, we thank you for the gift of salvation, that just like Ruth, we can choose to follow you, and we can choose to be a part of the community that you are creating. Thank you, God. Would you help us to become more like you each day, to take steps closer to you, and help us as we learn to follow you. In your name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, our hosts are going to come and they're going to give you some next steps. We found the best way to follow Jesus is in
community. And you know what? I am so excited to step into this fall season together because our team has been working on some incredible opportunities to do life together. This fall, we're going to start a brand new series. It's called Alone. It's going to start on September 15th. And alone is actually a feeling that each of us has and will experience in our lifetime. So we're going to take a deeper look at what it means to be alone, how God can take those lonely seasons of our lives, and ultimately the truth, what it means that we are never really, truly alone. Um, And of course, if you've been around One Church TO for any length of time, you'll know this. We love groups at One Church TO. We believe in community. We believe in doing life together. And we have all sorts of opportunities to find community at One Church TO. One of my favorites is our seniors this past year. They've started an exercise class. And weekly they meet for exercise, fitness, and community. We have group opportunities for all sorts of ages and stages. Our next-gen team has prepared amazing opportunities for your students and your kids to find community at One Church Geo. And parents, I want to encourage you, this is the season where we get to decide where our kids will spend their time. A time is coming where they will make those decisions. But this is the season, if you have children living in your home, this is the season where you get to decide where they're going to spend their time. So if you have students in grades 6 to 12, as a parent... As a pastor, I would highly encourage you to make it a priority to be dropping them off on Friday nights here at the church where they can experience community, where they can grow in their knowledge of Jesus, where they can be known, and where they can be known. As Pastor Shashan said, we have to make a decision. We get to raise our hand and say, I want to be in community. I'm going to invite us to stand as we close this morning. And in just a moment, our worship team is going to come up and they're going to lead us in a song that they actually wrote as a community this year. And this song talks about how God first embraced us into his community. And as he did that, he invites us to embrace others into the community of God as well. Now, just before we sing that, I'm going to invite Shesh back and he's going to pray for our community as we take steps towards becoming the type of community and the type of individuals that follow Jesus well together. Shesh, will you pray for us this morning? Thanks, Pastor Jessica. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor Jessica. One Church CEO, let's pray to our great God. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you loved us first as we were. Thank you, Father, for this church where we are loved and welcomed. Father, you not only gather us as your people, but you gather us as your family and as your children. Father, we thank you for that. Father, even as we look at the disciplines over the summer in the summer series, Father, let these disciplines be the pillars of our lives, Father. Father, for those who need rest, would you not draw close to them? Father, let them find that Sabbath rest in you, O God. Father, for those who are struggling to forgive and to let go, Father, let your Holy Spirit work in their lives, work in our lives, Father. Teach us to let go and to hold on to you, the one who never changes. Make us into a people that are thankful. Make us into a people that serve each other as you served us, Father. Father, I thank you, O God, that uh, even in this time of community, Father, for those who need community, for those, Father, who are longing to, um, to feel that love from you, Father, and so we just pray that, uh, that they would find community, that they would uh, be bold and courageous to be included, Father that you would remove obstacles, you would bring the right people into their lives that would nurture them and love them. And Father, that, um, that the fullness of joy that you have for them, that they would find it in this season. And for those others, Father, that you're speaking to their hearts, you're inspiring them. Father, you're prompting them that they need to go outside of their comfort zones. Father, into the boundaries, Father, into the margins that they could become the hands and feet of your son, Jesus. Father, inspire them to do that in this season. Father, let One Church TO 
be known for a church that one another is one another in the way that you have intended for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen.